Sorry, I'm a bit late today. Oh. So, how you been for Everything's okay? Working, I'm guessing now. Say that again? Yeah. Mashallah. Yeah. Yeah. Mashallah. Yeah. 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 الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وإمام المتقين وعلى آله وأصحابه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما وقال سبحانه وتعالى الذي يراك حين تقوم وتقلبك في الساجدين وقال سبحانه وتعالى إن الله لا يخفى عليه شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء وقال حبيبنا صلى الله عليه وسلم اتق الله حيثما كنت واتبع السيئه الحسنه تمحوها وخالق الناس بخلق حسن او كما قال عليه الصلاه والسلام اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم الحمد لله رب العالمين through the sheer mercy of Allah it's the 14th lesson of Riyadh al-Salihin now. Um, so many times it's good to remind ourselves that every single week passes and we spend our weeks and our days and our hours and our minutes, um, many of our hours and our minutes in the disobedience of Allah. We disobey Allah so many times over. But despite disobe- uh, disobeying, uh, disobeying Allah, Despite going against him, time after time, Allah still gives the ability, the tawfiq, to be in gatherings where we remember Allah. So this is only through the sheer mercy of Allah. And if you have been blessed to be in a gathering, if you have been blessed to be listening into such gatherings, and to take part in these gatherings, then I swear by Allah, it is because Allah wants goodness for you. When Allah wants goodness for a person, he gives them that ability and that tawfiq to listen to goodness. And what can be more greater than the words of Allah Himself and the words of our most beloved Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Last week we started a chapter called Babul Muraqaba. This is a very important chapter and it's the chapter wherein Imam Nawi Rahmatullahi Alayhi wants to take our attention and our focus upon a very important part of our Islam which is our heart and is our closeness and our connection with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Last week we started off with a very famous hadith, alhamdulillah. It was a very beautiful lesson last week when we demonstrated the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam uh, with a few of our students. And this week, continuing on, Imam uh, Nawi rahmatullah alayhi, he's going to say a few more beautiful ahadith. And I pray Allah gives me and you the tawfiq to understand from these ahadith and to take the lessons from it. So from hadith number 61. أنا أبي ذر جند بن بن جنادة وأبي عبد الرحمن معاذ بن جبل رضي الله تعالى عنهما أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال جندب رضي الله تعالى عنه who is جندب جندب is the first companion after the تحية السلام when the salam of the believers which is السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته when that was revealed it is mentioned that جندب is the first ever companion to greet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. This is Jundub radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. He passed away in the year 32 after Hijri. And from him, the scholars, uh, from the, the people, the ummah, have been blessed to have 281 hadith from Jundub. He narrates this hadith and with him, Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. He narrates this hadith also. Who is Mu'adh ibn Jabal? A very famous, famous companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is known, Rasulullah says, that from my ummah, from my companions, the most knowledgeable in regards of halal and haram is Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he accepted Islam at the age of 18. 
he was so close to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that very famous hadith, which I always love to mention as soon as the name Mu'ad comes. So I'm going to mention it again. A hadith of Al-Adab al-Mufrid, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is sitting with his companions, and Mu'ad is sitting also with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Rasulullah says, Ya Mu'ad, O oh Mu'ad. So Mu'ad says, Labbayka wa sa'adayka ya Rasulullah. O oh Messenger of Allah, I'm here. What's up? I'm here. So Rasulullah says again, Ya Mu'ad, O oh Mu'ad. So he says again, Labbayka wa sa'adayka ya Rasulullah. I'm here. What is it? Tell me. Everyone's you know, attentive. Oh Mu'ad, imagine I say to someone in three times over their name, Abdul Raqib, and I say with a way of attention, he'll get focused. You know, he wants to say something. So Rasulullah says again for the third time, Ya Mu'ad, O oh Mu'ad. So then Mu'ad says, Labbayka wa sa'adayka ya Rasulullah. I'm here. What's up? So from this to ulama I explained that obviously if you're calling someone their name three times over, you're trying to grab their attention. And the next thing that you're going to say is going to be very, very important. It's going to be so meaningful. It's going to be so important that you want that person to really listen to you. So if I sat and I said, Farhad, 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 three times over, and then I said something very important, Farhad, I think you should improve on this. I think you should work on this. Or Shaheed Bhai, I want to say this to you. You'd feel very glued. So Rasulullah did this with Mu'ad. Three times over, Mu'ad is listening, completely attentive. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Ya Mu'ad, inni uhibbuka fillah. O Mu'ad, I love you for the sake of Allah. And that's all it was. That's all it was. That I love you for the sake of Allah. Mu'ad was taken aback and he says, Wallahi, inni uhibbuka fillah aydan. O Rasulullah, I swear by Allah, I also love you for the sake of Allah. So this is how Rasulullah used to deal with this Mu'ad. This very Mu'ad, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, he became the governor of Yemen. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on his final year, before his demise, he sent uh, Mu'ad. He, he only selected the greatest of his companions to be his ambassador. So in Yemen, Islam was spreading, and now they needed a teacher, a governor in Yemen. So Rasulullah, from all of his companions, he selected Mu'ad, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whilst uh, departing from Mu'adh, he gave him a few advices. And this is very, very important. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam speaks to Mu'adh. This is the last time that Rasulullah is going to see Mu'adh. Rasulullah says to him, O oh Mu'adh, it's possible that when you return back to Medina Munawwara, you won't find me again. I will not be on the face of this earth anymore. So, O oh Mu'adh, I want to say a few words to you. From amongst the words, Rasulullah said, O oh Mu'adh, ittakullah, fear Allah alone. Fear Allah alone, and O Mu'adh, know that through distance we will be very, very far. But I swear by Allah, the closest to me is the one that has the most fear of Allah. So Rasulullah said, to, said this to Mu'adh. We find Rasulullah actually turned his face away when he said this to Mu'adh. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was teary and he was crying because he couldn't see the face of his beloved Mu'adh whilst departing from him. This is that very Mu'adh. He passed away very young at the age of 34. He passed away in the 18th year after Hijri and the Ummah is blessed to have 157 ahadith from Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So they both, Jundub and Mu'adh say, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ittaqillaha haythu ma kunt, fear Allah wherever you may be. This is a concept that many of us have forgotten. Many of us, we will stay away from sins because there's friends, there's family, there's someone watching you. But we have forgotten this very great advice of the Prophet ﷺ, that fear Allah, fear the disobedience of Allah, wherever you are, because no, haythuma kunt, wherever you will be, with you will be Allah. Allah will be there with you. So if you want to disobey Allah, the, a very beautiful uh, poem, wherein the poet says that, O oh, servant of Allah, if you feel that you want to disobey Allah, then do so, but find a place where he will not see you. We'll go there and disobey Allah. And obviously you won't find such a place. To disobey Allah, there is not a place where we can escape Allah. So Rasulullah says to his companions, that fear Allah wherever you may be. And whenever you find yourself to do wrong, don't lose hope either. When you find yourself doing wrong, follow it up with a good deed. Because that good deed will wipe away that wrong. Don't despair. Don't despair in the mercy of Allah. We will trip. We will fall. Being believers, being people that are used to fulfilling our own desires, even if it's contrary to the way of Allah, we trip and fall. But don't give up. Don't just think that I've done sin, I've done guna, and that's it. No. Pick up. Do something good in return. If you have disobeyed Allah, then quickly find an avenue. Find something where you can obey Allah again. Because your bad deed will be uh, taken away. وَخَالِكِ النَّاسَ بِخُلُقٍ حَسَنٍ 
And when you deal with people, deal with them with good character. Here the ulama make a very important point, and this is for every single person listening, those are, that are here right now, and those listening, and wherever my voice will go. Khalikin nas, be good to people, and nas. Rasulullah did not say that be good to Muslims only. He didn't say that. He said be good to people. Khulukin hasanin, be good to people, display yourself with good character. One thing where we feel is that if I know someone, if I know him, I'll be kind to him. If I know her, I'll be good to her. If he's a Muslim, yeah, I'll be good to them. If it's a friend that I know, it's a Jack or it's Sarah or whoever it may be, I'll be good to them because I know them. What about the rest of humanity? What about the rest of the people? What about that brother or that person that I don't know? But I know he's a good person. I know he's a believer. I know he's a human being. Why can't we be good to people? My Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and your Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, interact, be good to people, show good character, display good character. Islam is such a religion that through this good character, people accepted Islam. It's very upsetting that today, because of our character, because we are those people who mock people, we are those that do fraud, we are those that disobey Allah, we are those that we can't even smile. And then we expect goodness from people. We expect goodness when we can't even do a small, small act of a smile. We can't even do that much. When my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa says, smile, it is a means of sadaqah. Smile and it is a means of charity for you. That's what our religion teaches us. And my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa he informs us that be good to people. The next hadith is a very beautiful hadith and a very important one. Wherein, an Ibn Abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma, Ibn Abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma. Ibn Abbas is that companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was the cousin brother of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abbas is the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibn Abbas is the son of Abbas and who is the cousin brother of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibn Abbas, he was so accepted by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We find in the hadith of Sahih Bukhari. He served the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so much so, Rasulullah made a dua for him. Oh Allah, please give Ibn Abbas the understanding of the Qur'an and give him hikmah, give him wisdom. He became the greatest commentator of the glorious Qur'an after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through the barakah of the, of the dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Ibn Abbas says, قال, كنت خلف النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يوما how blessed is this companion Ibn Abbas? He says that I was sitting on a mount behind the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This reminds me of the final few days of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he came to the masjid before his illness took over and he couldn't attend the jama'ah in the masjid and Abu Bakr used to lead the salah. He led 17 salah whilst Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was ill. Before this illness took over, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, knowing that he's getting more weaker and weaker, he made an announcement in the masjid. He said, Oh my companions, if there is anyone that I owe anything to, if there is anyone that I owe anything to, then take your recompense today. Please do not hold me into account on the day of Qiyamah. Whatever I may owe you, if it may be gold, whatever it may be, I want you to take the recompense today. Don't hold me uh, on, on to question on the day of Qiyamah. None of the companions said anything, because Rasulullah didn't owe them anything, ex except for one. One companion, some ulama mentioned his name, some don't. He stood up, O Messenger of Allah, you owe me something, you owe me something. Rasulullah said what? He said, O Messenger of Allah, once I was in front of you. Whilst I was in front of you, I was, uh, you were mounted, and after you came off your mount, uh, I was in front, and accidentally, O Messenger of Allah, <coughs> sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what had happened, you had uh, pushed me, accidentally. You know, when you just accidentally, you know, push into someone, or you know, without knowing, kundas, you just fall into someone. O Messenger of Allah, you fell onto me. So I want the recompense of that. The Sahaba, radiyallahu anhu, confused. What are you saying? You know, you want the recompense of something like that. Where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa accidentally pushed on to you, now you want the recompense of that. And he mentioned a point, O oh, Messenger of Allah, when this happened, I was bare because he was on the state of ihram. So when you're in the state of ihram, obviously parts of your uh, upper body is exposed. So the part where my body was exposed, that's where you pushed me. That's where I felt the push. So now the co companions are feeling so, you know, uh, angry, annoyed. How can this companion ask from this? From the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now Rasulullah says, okay. What do you want? Because a messenger of Allah, I want it to be the case that now I go behind you and I push onto your body. The Prophet ﷺ, he said this to the Rasul ﷺ. The 
So Rasulullah said, come, you may push on to me. So Rasulullah sallallahu presented himself. The companion says, no. When that happened to me, that part of my body was exposed. I don't want it to be the case that I push onto your clothes. Rather, I want you to move your upper shawl, your upper garment, and I want my chest to touch your back. I want my skin to touch your skin. So this companion, radiyallahu ta'ala, he requested this from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa His request was accepted, and then he placed his chest onto the back of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, touching skin to skin. Companions are angry. How dare you? How dare you do this? He explains to those that came to him, that you don't understand. I want to be, because Rasulullah is ill, and we can see that it's possible that he won't be with us much longer. I want to be the final person that has the honor to say that my body touched the body of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why he requested this. Ibn Abbas is amongst those who was blessed to be uh, riding on the same mount behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How old was he when this hadith took place? This is a hadith of Sahih Tirmizi. Uh, Tirmizi. Hadha hadith on Hassan on Sahih, an authentic hadith by Imam Tirmizi, wherein Ibn Abbas at this time of his life, he was only 10 years old when this incident took place. Rasulullah said a few words of advice to him. Listen very carefully. This, these are the advices to a 10 year old. But in reality, it should be for every single person. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ya ghulam, O oh my beloved son, O oh my beloved youngster, inni u'allimuka kalimatin, I want to teach you a few words of advice. I want to teach you a few words. What are they? Ihfadillaha yahfadhuka, O my beloved son, O oh my beloved youngster, that I want to say to you that ihfadillah, Protect the commands of Allah. Protect the commands of the deen of Allah. Yahfadka. Allah will protect you. Ihfadillah tajidhu tujahak. Protect the laws of Allah. And I swear by Allah, you will find Allah in front of you. Whatever you do, Allah will always be at your assistance. Ida sa'alta. Whenever you ask, whenever you want something, whenever you will ask, fas'alillah. Only ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa ida sta'anta. When you need help, Fasta'in billah, only ask Allah for help. Don't, you don't need to go to anyone else. Only ask Allah for help. Wa'lam, and know this. And this is a very, very important point in the next part of the hadith. You, me and you, in our lives, because of the way we are, we feel as though that there are many people there trying to harm us. We will know that there are people that are hasideen, jealous people, people that will hate on you. People who won't be happy with your successes. People who won't be happy with what Allah has blessed you with. You will meet such people. You'll we'll meet people who naturally, they won't have an inclination towards you. They won't like you. You'll meet family members that are not happy with your successes. Cousin, cousin, brother, cousin, brother, 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 sister, siblings, between family members. You'll find that some will not like you. And some will actively make an effort to harm you. They will either try to do wrong to you in the form of black magic. They will either try to do wrong to you in the form of causing some sort of grief to you. Should you really be concerned? No, if you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I swear by Allah, you have nothing to worry about. Rasulullah says, O oh, Ibn Abbas, listen. Anna al ummata ala bi shay'in. If the whole of humanity was to gather together to benefit you, Lam yanfa'uka illa bi shay'in qad katabahullahu lak, then I swear by Allah, they will not be able to benefit you except that Allah has written for you to benefit it from. So if everyone came together to try to benefit you, they can't benefit you unless Allah wanted that. And vice versa, If the whole of humanity, not just one or two people, not one or just one or two haters, not just one or two jealous people, if the whole of humanity was to come together to give you some sort of harm, Rasulullah says, if, if and me and you, we believe in the words of our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لَمْ يَدُرُّوكَ إِلَّا بِشَيْءٍ قَدْ كَتَبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ No one, nothing will be able to harm you except that what Allah has written for you. And this is a part of Iman and this is why the chapter is about this. We need to make a connection with Allah alone. And the first step, and I mentioned this last week and I'm going to reiterate my point, which is we need to repent to Allah. We need to ask Allah for forgiveness. The reason why we are very distant from Allah is because we have no connection with our Creator. You see, there were people before me and you that they were so connected to Allah when they said something, it happened their way. For example, just yesterday, Ibn Majah, Hadith of Ibn Majah, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he is the Khalifa of Islam. He has a reign of 10 years where he is the leader of the believers. 
He sends Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas to Egypt to be the governor of Egypt. There is a complaint from Egypt that the river Nile has a completely, um, uh, the water has completely stopped and it's a great drought. The, water, the river Nile has completely come to an end. And they have a custom in Egypt that every year in the summer season when the river Nile does not flow, then they sacrifice a beautiful young woman and they place her inside there, they kill her and they wait for the water to return. That's their tradition. So uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, he wrote a letter to the Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This letter to this day is still protected and this letter is still recorded in the books of Hadith, in the books of uh, history. Abu Musa, uh, Sa'ad ibn Abu Waqqas says, O oh, Amiru Mu'minin, O oh, the belie- leader of the believers, the river Nile is not flowing and they have this evil tradition in Egypt. What do you command me to do? How do I explain to the people? Umar radiallahu anhu, he writes a reply. In the reply he says, مِنْ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ عُمَرْ إِبْنِ الْخَطَّابِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ عَنْهُ إِلَىٰ نَحْرِ اللِّيلِ نَحْرُ النِّيلِ I, Umar رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ عَنْهُ write, not a letter to Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, I write this letter to the river Nile itself. So he writes a letter to the river Nile. He says to Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, I want you to place my letter to the river Nile. In the letter he writes, O river Nile, if you flow and if you are from the command of Allah, then I, Umar ibn Khattab, command you to flow for the sake of Allah alone. If you flow because of some evil uh, tradition or because of some other custom, then Umar and the believers, we are not in need of you. We do not need you. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, when he received the letter, he was instructed, throw it inside the river. He threw it inside the river Nile. Within that moment, the river Nile gushed forth and the water came back. This is Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. That same Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu in his reign, once ever, in the history of Medina Munawwara, an earthquake took place. The earthquake was happening, Umar radiallahu ta'ala is walking. He stamps the ground. He says, oh Medina, you are shaking? Me Umar, have I done any injustice to the commands of Allah? Have I done any wrong to the commands of Allah? I command you stop shaking. Medina Munawwara stopped shaking. The ulama write in their books, Hafiz ibn Hajjah al-Asqalani, rahimahullah ta'ala, we have hope in Allah, till the day of Qiyamah, Madinah Munawwara, will not receive an earthquake again, because of Umar radiallahu ta'ala. These are those people. Why? They were connected to Allah. And Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala, anhum, if, if it seems for me and you very far-fetched, that they're very far, no. Throughout the era, throughout times, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has displayed how so many, so many, People have come, and because of their connection with Allah, they have done amazing things. They have surpassed the limits of humanity. They have showed that with the help of Allah, anything is possible. But our problem is, why do these things sound like fairy tales? Because we don't have Allah. We don't have Allah in our life. We are so not conscious of Allah. We have become so deprived of Allah. And this heart of ours, what we have done today, we have given this heart away to everything and everyone else. To my wealth, to my money, to my wife, or to whoever, to my family, to my children, to every other asset in life. And we have forgotten that the core and the reservoir for the heart is Allah. That if Allah is inside this heart, then you can take away streams and connect it to other things. But that's our problem. So we need to have that focus. There are some people, they go towards something. They find uh, a woman to marry and they fall in love with this woman. And their whole aim and their whole objective just that one woman. What have you achieved? Make Allah your objective. Make Allah yours. And then when you will love, you will only love for the sake of Allah. That's what we need. That's what we need. Subhanallah. So the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continues to say, Rufi'at al-aqlam. The pen has been raised. Whatever is meant to be will come your way. Whatever good is meant to be will come your way. Whatever wrong is meant to be will come your way. Wajafrat is suhuf and the pages and the ink has tried. Whatever Allah has planned for you will come about. But because we don't know, we need to continue striving for goodness. Don't ever fall into this stupid, stupid mindset. Yeah, whatever is meant to be is going to happen. Yeah, if I pray or not, whatever is meant to be. No, that's not the way it should be. The companion said this to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Messenger of Allah, Hadith of Allah Ibn Mufrad by Ibn Mas'ud. If Allah knows everything, what's the point? What's the point of praying Salah? What's the point of making an effort with Allah? 
Like, listen to the answer of Rasulullah and that is suffice for us. Rasulullah says to Ibn Mas'ud, Yes, Allah knows what's going to happen to you. But do you know what's going to happen? No, Messenger of Allah. Then you continue striving for what's meant to be. And if you are a man from the people of Jannah, then the path towards Jannah will be made easy for you. And if you are a person of Jahannam, then the path towards Jahannam will be made easy for you. And we need to ask ourselves, if we are on the path of Jahannam, isn't it time that we turn back and go towards the path of Jannah? An Anas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu qal, إِنَّكُمْ لَتَعْلَمُونَ أَعْمَالًا هِيَ أَدَكُّ فِي أَعْيُنِكُمْ مِنَ الشَّعْرِ كُنَّا نَعُدُّهَا عَلَىٰ أَحْدِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مِنَ الْمُوبِقَاتِ Anas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu says that indeed you people, he now addresses the tabi'een, those that came after the companions, those that were blessed to see the companions, he says that you people, you consider, you consider an evil act, as fine and as small as a small fine piece of hair. But we, the companions, at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, any, any small bad deed, small, you know, coated together, small bad deed, we consider it to be very destructive. Amongst our pious predecessors, we find a scholar very beautifully explains that if you know that there is a great serpent coming towards you, a large serpent, poisonous serpent, would you run? Obviously you will run, you will run away from it. But if a small poisonous snake came towards you, would you still run? Yes, you would. Because that is also very poisonous, that can also destroy you. Me and you, we have classified sins in such a way that we think major sins, minor sins. Oh, it's minor, who cares? Oh, it's makru, it's disliked, who cares? The reality is, no sin is major or minor. The ulama have only come after to kind of differentiate so that we understand the laws of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. That, okay, for this sin, there's no compensation in this world. You only have to repent. Other sins, major sins, you have to do something in return. If you, you know, on purpose, with full intention, you break a fast of the month of Ramadan, then I'm sorry, you've got 60 days of fasting coming your way. If you go for Hajj and you don't fulfill the commands of Hajj, then you're going to have to sacrifice a few animals when you come back. Or you're going to have to repeat your Hajj. If you don't give your zakat, then I'm sorry to say you're just filling your stomach with fire. And that fire will be burning you on the day of Qiyamah also. So there are certain sins that there is some sort of punishment already promised, already written. But every sin is wrong because a sin isn't just a sin. We need to change our definition of sin. The word sin is so lightly used, that is not the case. It should be now that I am disobeying Allah. It is, it is still sin equals disobedience of Allah. It's not major minor, it's a disobedience of Allah. My Allah isn't happy. When you become connected to Allah, then you don't want to displease Allah. When you have love for the person as your beloved now, every step you make, you want to make them happy. Shouldn't it be the case that with Allah, we, we are so attentive that we make an effort that I don't want to displease my Creator Allah. My Allah has created me, He's given me everything. Why am I always tripping? When you do trip, such is that this beloved of ours, that when you trip, he still allows you a chance to come back to him. If you were to be dishonest, if you weren't faithful to your beloved, your family member, your parents, your spouse, whoever it may be, first time they'll forgive you, second time they'll forgive you, third time maybe they'll forgive you. But as soon as you get to the fifth, sixth, seventh time, they'll be sick of you, that you always ask for forgiveness, why are you doing but this beloved, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that if you disobey me and you don't ask me for forgiveness, I become angry with you. I want you to ask me for forgiveness. If you disobey Allah thou- a thousand times, that very Allah says to you, I want you to repent and come back to me on the thousand time. Uh, Urdu poet very beautifully says, Jo sobar tore wa sobar jore. That person who destroys this connection with Allah 100 times, he makes an effort to rejoin that connection with Allah 100 times. Sheikh Shibli, rahimahullah ta'ala, take a very beautiful lesson from this incident. This is written in the books of our history of our pious predecessors. Sheikh Shibli, rahimahullah ta'ala, he comes for Umrah. He goes for Umrah and he's circulating the house of Allah. He goes for Umrah, he's circulating the house of Allah and this is the status of those people that become connected to Allah. While circulating the house of Allah, he can hear another servant of Allah saying, Labbaik, Ya Rabbi, Labbaik, Labbaik, La Sharika, Labbaik, that, Oh Allah, I am present, Oh Allah, I am present. Sheikh Shibli can hear this, that there is someone also in Umrah saying this, 
to Sheikh Shibli being Sheikh Shibli, and this happens to the pious servants of Allah, that Allah opens certain things that no one else, the ordinary folk don't understand. Sheikh Shibli, whilst this person says, Labbaik, Labbaik, La Sharika, La Labbaik, Sheikh Shibli says, I hear a reply to this. I reply a voice from the heavens saying, La Labbaik, your presence here is not accepted. You coming here is not accepted in my court. You coming here is not accepted. So Sheikh Shibli is astonished. The man is saying, Labbaik, and he, and he, Sheikh Shibli can hear a voice saying, La Labbaik, you coming to my house isn't accepted. I, I don't accept you. So Sheikh Shibli, after finishing his tawaf, his umrah, he looks around to find who is this person who is saying, Labbaik, La Sharika, Labbaik. He finds the person. He calls him. But brother, uh, are you the person that's saying, Labbaik, La Sharika, Labbaik? Yes. So he asks him that. Do you hear anything? Any sort of response? Anything? Do you hear anything? So the person says that, yes, I, I do. I hear that uh, a voice is saying to me, La labbaik, la sharik, la labbaik. That your presence, your labbaik here isn't accepted. So Sheikh Shibli says, oh, so you hear this too? You hear the reply? He goes, yes, I hear the reply. So now Sheikh Shibli says to him, okay, then if you hear that your Allah and Allah is saying to you, he doesn't accept you, then why, why do you carry on saying it? I can, I've heard it so many times over in my tawaf that your voice is coming to my ear and I can also hear the reply. So why do you continue saying it? And now listen to this man's reply. This man says that the reality is, yes, I hear, I hear the voice saying that my presence here isn't accepted. But the question is, where else do I have to go? Well, who else do I have? Is there another creator that I can go to? If there was a different Allah, then I'll leave this Allah and I'll go to that Allah. But I have no other Allah. I have no other creator. He's my only creator. If he's happy with me, he's not happy with me. I have nowhere else to go. He's my only Allah. So Sheikh Shibli listened to this reply, astonished. The man continues to go around the house of Allah. Labbaik, la sharik, labbaik. If you accept me or not, I am still your servant. I am still your servant. He goes around the house of Allah, house of Allah. Sheikh Shibli writes, pen on paper he writes, I swear by Allah, when he went around that second time around the house of Allah, now I hear saying, Ya Abdi, your labbaik he has been accepted. You have understood me now. You've understood your creator. You've understood Allah. And that's what Allah wants from me and you. That it's never too late. I hate this concept when people say that, oh brother, you know, Allah is only for the pious, the hafiz, the maulana, the scholar. No. It's your Allah, it's my Allah. Who said it's only for the pious? Who said it's only for the sheikh? Who said it's only for the scholar? Who said that a general, normal sister can't be a pious servant of Allah? Who said me and you cannot be a pious servant of Allah? Amongst the female illuminaries of the world, Rabia Basri, Rahimahallah Ta'ala, she goes around, such an honored woman, so connected to Allah, an example for every single sister out there. Rabia Basri, she goes out of her home holding a bucket of water and some firewood. And she speaks out loud that I am going to now with the fire of water, with the bucket of water, I will extinguish the fire of Jahannam. With this firewood, I am going to go burn the Jannah. Have she, has she gone crazy? What's she saying? People stopped her. What are you saying? She says, I want to use this water and burn, uh, extinguish the fire of hell. Because I want to know that there are some people who only worship Allah because they're scared of the fire. I want to know now that who is there that will worship Allah if there was no Jahannam. And this Jannah that Allah has created, I want to burn it away. Because I know some people only worship Allah because they want to go to Jannah. Rabia Basri says, I want to know who is there out there. That if there was no Jannah, no Jahannam, no fear of Jahannam, no hope of Jannah, who will worship Allah only for the sake of Allah? I want to know who there is. I will worship Allah for Allah alone. This is the pinnacle. Or well, my respected teacher, uh, Mufti Talibuddin Sab, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, who passed away uh, many years ago, approximately 2008, he passed away. Uh, one of the greatest um, shuyukh of our time in Oldham, Mufti Talibuddin Sab, Rahmatullahi Alayhi. Before he passes away, I remember being in his final ever dars, where he used to sit in the masjid and he used to uh, confront and he used to speak to us all. He says a very beautiful uh, po uh, po uh, piece of poetry and the amazing thing is this poetry became the final words on his lips before he passed away also. The poetry was 
جنت اور دزخ سے رب میں کیا کروں او اللہ وت جن اون جہنم وٹ شوڈ آئی ڈو جنت اور جنت اور جہنم دزخ سے رب میں کیا کروں آرزو ہے کہ میں تجھے دے کیا کروں مائی اونلی وش اینڈ مائی اونلی ہوپ از دا آئی گیٹ ٹو میٹ یو اللہ آئی ڈونٹ وانٹ اینی تھنگ ایلس آئی ڈونٹ وانٹ جہنم اینڈ جہنم آئی جسٹ وانٹ یو اف یو ہیو دا کنگ اف یو ہیو دا کنگ دین یو ہیو ہز کنگڈم اف یو ہیو اللہ دین آٹومیٹکلی یو ہیو جہنم اب آور فوکس از ویری لمیٹڈ میک اللہ یور فوکس اینڈ دس از وائی وی فائنڈ رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم ہاؤ فوکس یو ہیز ود اللہ یو سی دا ورڈ اللہ ہیز سچ این پاور اف یو ہیو بین بلیسڈ ٹو سی اللہ وانس سو اف ایون سی اللہ وانس اللہ اینڈ یو کین سی ون مور ٹائم سی ون مور ٹائم اللہ دا اسکالر از رائٹ اف یو سیڈ اللہ وانس اینڈ یو ہیو بین گیون دا ابیلٹی ٹو سی اللہ اگین دین آئی سویئر بائی اللہ اللہ ایکسیپٹڈ یور فرسٹ ٹائم آف سینگ اللہ دس وائی ہیو لاؤ ٹو سی to the extent the hadith of sahih bukhari rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is leaning on a tree he is resting his sword is hung up on the tree on the branch of the tree a person comes and he sees that this is my chance to assassinate and naudhu billah min zalik rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he goes towards the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam takes the sword of rasulullah and says to muhammad oh muhammad i'm going to take you now who will save you oh muhammad rasulullah looks at him hadith of sahih bukhari rasulullah when he says one word Rasul looks at the man and says in a very powerful with a lot of robe and a lot of awe Rasulullah says Allah Allah will save me Upon saying this hadith of Sahih Bukhari the man's hand shakes he puts down the sword his hands are shaking that the word of Allah has such an effect on him he's shaking he puts down the sword Rasulullah takes the sword and says who will save you now and the person says I have no one that can save me رسول اللہ لیٹس ہم بی دس پرسن گوز اوے حدیث اف صحیح بخاری ہی گوز اوے ہی پرفارمز غسل ہی کمز وقت ٹو رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم سیز دیٹ اف سچ از دی افیکٹ اف دی نیم اف اللہ اینڈ دس از واٹ آئی ہیو فیلٹ دین آئی وانٹ ٹو ایکسیپٹ اسلام اون یور ہینڈز اشہد ان لا الہ الا اللہ و اشہد انک محمد رسول اللہ اینڈ آئی ایکسیپٹ دیٹ یو ار دی میسنجر اف اللہ دس واز دی ایمان مائن یور ایمان وی فائن وی وی شائی اوے فرام سینگ دی نیم اف اللہ Rather, the name of Allah is a very powerful effect. The Asma al-Husna, the glorious Quran, Allah himself says, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَا الْحُسْنَا Allah's beautiful names, فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا Call Allah with these names. Call Allah. Try calling Allah. Me and you, when we need to talk to someone, we look for avenues of people after people after people. Rasulullah teaches us that when you're going through the most difficult parts of your life, when things are going wrong at home, things are going wrong with family, work, whatever, and everything that's going wrong, You don't need anyone. You only need Allah. You only need Allah. Try speaking to Allah. Try saying to Allah. Literally say in your own language. That, oh Allah, I'm going through a hard time. Help me. Every other person, if I went to Abdul Raqib and I explained to him that I'm going through a difficult time, I'd have to sit there and spend at least 30 minutes explaining that difficult time first. That this was happening, that was happening. With Allah, you don't have to explain to him. Just say to Allah, oh Allah, You know what's going on. You know how I'm feeling. You know what's inside my heart. You know what's troubling me. Please just help me. You don't even have to waste time explaining to Allah. Allah already knows. This is the creator that we have. It's upsetting that we don't make an effort. An effort doesn't mean that you have to wake up at the hajjad today. It doesn't mean that you sit at the corner of the room and start holding your hands and talking to Allah. Talk to Allah in your heart. Speak to Allah when you're around people. A poet very beautifully says that I sit amongst people, I sit amongst hundreds, I sit amongst thousands, but I swear to you, my heart is only with you. I don't have anyone, I don't care. I'm sitting with people, wise people. Jaha me dekhta hoon, udar dekhta hoon, idar dekhta hoon, sirf tu hi ko dekhta hoon. Wherever I look, I look here, I look there. The only thing I see is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When I look towards her face, I think this is the creation of Allah. I only remember my Allah. When I look there, when I look here, wherever I look, it's only about my Allah. And that's the focus. And that's the effort that takes play in a person's heart. When a person is making such an effort to connect him or herself to Allah, then your whole mindset changes. Everything changes. Then you don't look at who's in front of you. A great sheikh from Delhi, um, this sheikh, he went for a bayan. And it was a very big bayan, big talk. Thousands came. He delivered the bayan. He comes out of the masjid, a man comes running. He doesn't recognize the sheikh. Oh, have I missed the bayan? Have I missed the bayan? So the sheikh doesn't say that it's me, I'm the sheikh. He goes, yeah, yeah the bayan's finished. Oh, I'm just, 
you know, I've just come from such a, such a far place. I've come to take part in this bayan. I heard such a great sheikh came. I missed out the bayan. So then the sheikh says, sit down. On the step of the masjid, Delhi, Grand Masjid of Delhi, sit down. Nahmaduhu wa nusalli wa nusallimu ala rasooli al-kareem amma ba'd. An approximate one and a half, two hour bayan. In front of that one person, he gives the whole two-hour bayan. Those around him ask him, Sheikh, you just spent two hours giving the bayan there. Why are you giving it again to him? Listen to the reply of the Sheikh. The being that I gave the bayan for two hours just before is the same being that I'm, is the same being that I'm giving the same bayan for again. That being was Allah then, and that same being is still Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does it matter? If you benefit, alhamdulillah. If people benefit, alhamdulillah. But the focus is Allah. And you can never be disappointed in life. It doesn't matter who's sitting in front of you, who's not. It doesn't matter who comes, who doesn't. It doesn't matter who understands you, who doesn't understand you. Do it for Allah. Make Allah happy. Everything becomes yours. I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me any the ability to understand this. An Abi Hurairah radiyallahu ta'ala anhu an al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal inna Allah ta'ala yagharun wa ghayratu Allah an ya'ti al-mar'u ma harram Allah alayhi Abu Hurairah radiyallahu ta'ala anhu narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a sense of discontent in the Arabic language it's ghayrat in Urdu you call it ghayrat the best way to explain this is the way the uh, scholars have explained with the hadith of Sahih Bukhari Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, I was blessed to see Jannah in my dreams. I saw Jannah al firdaus and I was wandering the streets of Jannah. All of a sudden I came and I saw a grand palace in Jannah. In that grand palace, as soon as you enter the palace just on the entrance and where the gates are of this grand palace of Jannah, I saw a water fountain. And next to that water fountain, I saw a very beautiful maid, maiden of Jannah performing wudu. I look towards this maiden, obviously the beauty of Jannah, you can imagine Rasulullah says, I look towards the beauty of this maiden and the beauty of the palace, thinking that this must be my palace, this must be a maiden that Allah has given me. I ask an angel who is in the heavens, whose palace is this, whose maiden is this? So beautiful, everything beautiful about the palace and the maiden. The angel replies that this is the palace of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and this is the maiden that Allah will give to Umar radiallahu anhu. Rasulullah says, as soon as I heard the name Umar, this is the Nabi of Allah, the Messenger of Allah. Rasulullah says, that as soon as I heard that this is the maiden of Umar, my eyes turned away, out of ghayrat, out of the honor and respect of Umar, that how dare I look towards the maiden of Umar, I looked away. Rasulullah narrates this hadith and this incident to Umar, Umar starts to cry, radiallahu anhu, Ya Rasulullah, I will be like this towards you. How can I be like this? If you are saying that you have seen this, then whatever I will be given is only through the blessing of you. I accepted Islam through you. I found Allah through you. How can I dare even you know, react like that? But Rasulullah says, No, Umar. Such is your honor, such is your dignity, such is the awe, awe that you have about you. That even the messenger of Allah felt the need that I can't look towards there. This is called ghayrat. This is called that protection and that sense of honor a man has that if one was to give a second look to his wife then you'd be getting a punch on your face before you turn away that's the kind of ghayrat that Allah puts in people so here to explain the ghayrat of Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he also has this ghayrat when a person disobeys Allah Ma'harram Allahu Ali. That thing that Allah has made haram upon you, if you are that person who is going towards that haram, know that Allah has that sort of behavior with you. That Allah is very discontent and Allah is displeased with you. So imagine the opposite. If Allah is happy with you, then Allah becomes yours. To the extent we find in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, authentic hadith, wherein Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, when a person becomes closer to Allah, to it, through the fara'id, through the compulsory actions of salah, of zakat, of hajj, etc. He becomes so close to the accent now, he continues to excel with nawafil, with optional prayer, with op- optional acts, to the extent that his eyes become such that, he only, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes his eyes. That he only sees those things that Allah wants him to see. His hands become controlled by Allah to the extent he only touches, he only grabs and only goes towards those things that Allah wants him to go towards. His feet become controlled by Allah. To the extent that Allah says in the hadith that that person who makes any sort of dishonor towards a wali of mine, a friend of mine, 
Allah says, I declare war upon that person. I declare war upon that person who dare tries to go against my friends. This is the connection that a person has when he or she makes an effort. Effort. Don't ever let anyone tell you that it's not possible. Whatever stage you're on. There may be some people sitting here, some uh, at home, that are struggling with salah, just the actual salah. Then make an effort. Don't, don't become despondent. Start, start. Allah wants you to change. Umar radiallahu anhu, he left his home in the sixth year of prophethood with his sword out. With what intention? I'm going to take the life of this Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I've had enough of him. Six years, he's caused chaos in Mecca. He's caused so much confusion. He's gone against the religion of our fathers. That same Umar today is sleeping next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is that Umar today. It's possible for everyone. Everyone. Abu Sufyan, he spent over 20 years against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Battle of Badr, Battle of Uhud, against the Prophet. His wife, Hind, she chewed the liver of the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She made a necklace out of the liver of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. She accepts Islam with Abu Sufyan. Rasulullah puts everything aside. If I accepted Islam, then my personal want and my personal feelings, everything aside, Allah has forgiven everything that you've done. Abu Sufyan accepts Islam just before Makkah is conquered. He comes to the Prophet Sallallahu after 20 years, 20 years, and he accepts Islam. Me and you, if someone doesn't accept our words in 20 days, we become tired. If someone doesn't accept our words in two months, we're like, oh, forget it. He doesn't understand, she doesn't understand. My Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his 23 years of his life was such that he went through this and he didn't give up on people. So we have no right to be giving up on anyone. Mm, the next hadith is very long hadith. Inshallah, I will speak about this hadith next week, inshallah. But before we finish, very, very important point, which is, please, everyone sitting here, everyone listening, everyone sitting here, please, make an attempt. Don't let anyone bring you down. Don't let people come to you and say to you that you are such a such a person. You did this, you did that. Don't let your past ever get to you. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't become connected to Allah. This path of Tawbah, turning back to Allah, is open till death for every single person. But isn't it better that I quickly turn back to Allah and then live a life? I swear by Allah, you will live such a life. I swear by Allah, just tread on it. You don't even have to live the life. Tread on it and see how Allah assists you in every single thing possible. Allah will be yours. And if Allah is yours, everything is yours. One final hadith for today then. Hadith of Sahih Bukhari. When you truly, truly become Allah's, truly, truly become Allah's, Allah loves you. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love you, I swear by Allah, you've accomplished the acceptance of this world and the hereafter. Hadith of Sahih Bukhari. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he loves someone, يُحِبُّ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَلَى فُلَانًا Allah loves Abbas, Allah loves Umar, Allah loves Shahan, Allah loves Tawfiq, Allah loves Atiq, Allah loves Shaheed, whoever and everyone. When Allah loves a person, Allah calls the most closest of his creation in the heavens, Jibreel alayhi salam. Allah nada Jibreel. Allah says, إِنِّي أُحِبُّ فُلَانًا I, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I love such a such a person. That I love Aisha, I love whoever it may be. I love her and I love him, this person. Allah says, O Jibreel, ahibbuhu. You have been commanded that you have to love this person now. Jibreel, you hibbu fulanan. Jibreel starts automatically now. Allah loves, I also love. Jibreel starts to love. Then Jibreel in the heavens, all the inhabitants of the heavens, he calls out, Ya Ahl as sama O oh, you, the inhabitants of the heavens, all of you angels. How many angels are there? There's a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam directly on, in, on top of the Kaaba. There is a Kaaba of the angels. Since the angels were created, on top of this Kaaba is their Kaaba in the heavens. Every single day, 70,000 angels do the tawaf of their Kaaba. Until the day of Qiyamah, not one angel will have a chance to repeat his tawaf in his whole lifetime. That's how many angels there are. 70,000. Now you times that by however many years Allah has created his angels. Allah created angels before jinn, before human being. You can imagine how many thousands and millions and trillions of angels there are. Ya Ahl as sama Oh you, all of you angels. Allah loves a person. I, Jibreel, love that person. You have all been commanded to start loving that person. Till every single angel in the heaven starts to love that person. It doesn't end there. 
then on the first heaven an announcement is made. Ya ahdal ard, O you the inhabitants of the earth, the birds in the sky, fishes in the sea, all of the animals on land, underground, wherever they may be, Allah loves such a person, Abdul Aziz. Jibreel loves Abdul Aziz. The angels all love Abdul Aziz. You have all been commanded to love such a person. And every single creation of Allah in their hearts, the love of this person is put. Till what point? Till the extent that acceptance is written for that person on the face of this earth. What does that mean? The ulama explain, wherever this person goes. You may know him for a few moments. Natural inclination, natural love for that person. You see that person once, he smiles or whatever. You love that person now. Automatically you have some sort of respect, some sort of awe for that person. That mashallah, this is a very good person. That's it. Allah puts acceptance on the face of this earth. And there are so many hidden gems that no one knows. But Allah knows and all of these the inhabitants of the heavens know, the creation know them. And they've made it in the court of Allah. Me and you need to make that same effort. That hadith it doesn't say fulan and doesn't mean aliman, hafizan. No, no, no. You don't have to be hafiz. You don't have to be alim. You don't have to be anything but the servant of Allah. And that will apply to you. And every single person is the servant of Allah. I pray Allah gives me and you that realization. Make an effort, please. Now, Allah, I feel like begging everyone's feet right now. I'm saying it for myself. I'm saying it for everyone now. That if you want true happiness, true every time, when you will go through a very hard time, even then Allah will be yours. The ulama explained with a waterproof watch. If you have a watch which is waterproof, no matter how much it's surrounded with water, it's still waterproof. This heart of ours, no matter how much grief surrounds it, if it is grief proof with the love of Allah, then no grief can come inside your heart. Allah will always protect you. So use the analogy of the water with the, the watch which is waterproof. It's surrounded with water and it still does not find water inside it. A uh, poet very beautifully says, O oh you disbeliever, O oh you who is against Allah, you, you are sitting on the beach with the fear of the storm. But I, I am in the storm, yet I feel the comfort of the beach. That I am connected to my Allah. I've got Allah. It doesn't matter. Make an effort. And everyone here, everyone listening, we're all in different stages. There's no need to compare. There's no need to say that, mashallah, Ustad Atik there t- telling us to connect with Allah. You know, he, he's chilling. You know, he's a half face. He's this, he's that. No. I've got my own struggles. I've got a lot to work on myself. I've got so much uh, tawbah, repentance that I need to do to Allah for my wrongs. If I sit here trying to tell you my wrongs, there won't be any more Friday Hadith class anymore. <laughs> no one will want to see me anymore. It'll be finished. So we've got so much to work on. And everyone's on different stage. So work with yourself. I pray Allah Ta'ala accepts us all. Jazakallah mm-hmm. khairan ahsan jaza. Literally, what day is today? Friday. So only one to two announcements. And I'm going to let everyone go, inshallah. First announcement is, the way we have a Hadith class, those of you that are free, some people prefer Mondays. So the way we've had this uh, Hadith class every Friday, Alhamdulillah, just recently, it's only been nine lessons now, we have a Monday Quran Tafsir class, where we've started from Surah Fatiha, and we've got, been going through Surah Baqarah, and we've been going through the verses of the glorious Quran. It's the uh, same, same setting, same place. Whoever has time, try to take part, nine till ten. Because the Quran class is just growing, and it's quite small, so inshallah this week, about, Alhamdulillah, there's a lot of brothers sitting here, and mashallah, a lot of people listening online. The Quran is very new, so because it's a bit more of a controlled group, uh, inshallah, this Monday we'll be having some tea and some snacks whilst we're listening to the tafsir also, inshallah. We've invested into a, what do you call them? A flask. Uh, you know those camping flasks or something. So whoever can take part, you can enjoy a cup of tea with us too, inshallah, on Monday. And more so, if that's a cup of tea for Monday, this is something where you can enjoy a cup of tea at home too, inshallah. To support our work, al is an organization that was established in May, alhamdulillah, through the guidance of my respected and my honorable teachers from Darulun Bari. So we've started this organization, al uh, where we do events, we have courses, etc. A few things going on. Friday and Monday is our public classes, which is this and on Monday. And just to kind of support our work, and at the same time, we want to give back. We are selling mugs. These are five pound, and there's five different coats on it. Something that... Um, a few of the students from the <coughs> Aradab classes, 
they've kind of thought that from the five quotes that I normally say, we've kind of gathered five of the top quotes. So it's something inspirational. I pray that you might be enjoying your cup of tea or someone at home and they're reading something like, don't worry, it's going to be okay. And that might be enough for their day to go okay. We pray that Allah makes a means of barakah. It's five pounds. All the profit goes towards uh, al -adab. And uh, yeah, you can choose whichever coat you fancy. And I pray that you make dua for us. May Allah accept It's really nice to see my dear friends from Rochdale. And uh, as always, the Ashton brothers. And not to forget my beloved older brothers too. May Allah accept.